of our distinguished lectures on gateways to emergent behavior in science and society. Uh, this is a part of a course that Alex Navratsky, who's sitting there, and I are teaching uh, for the first time at Davis. And uh, we welcome all of you as either students or potential students in our class. And uh, in a sense, our motto is the same as that for a companion course that Steve Hartzog is teaching, TCS 198. It's borrowed from Robert Oppenheimer. What we don't know, we teach one another. That was his definition of theoretical physics. So we're very pleased to have Simon Levin here tonight. Simon began life as an applied mathematician working, getting his PhD at the Institute for Fluid Dynamics at Maryland. While there, he already began to be interested in problems in biology. He went to Cornell where he stayed for 27 years, 27 years, and then 20 years ago, I mean, he's a little bit older than he looks, quite a bit. Uh, he, uh, moved, he moved to uh, Cornell, from Cornell to Princeton, where he's been for the last 20 years and, and is connected to somewhere between two and 10 departments. I did ask him about his graduate students. He said, well, I have two here, two there, six here, another two there. He has an, I think he's had a profound influence, not just on Princeton, but on the academic community in general or on our society in general. He's met, received many, many awards for his work. He is arguably a pioneer, and perhaps the leading theoretical ecologist that we have, but he's interested in many, many more things than that and he's taken on this emerging challenge of sustainability. Simon. Thanks very much, David. Um, and Alex, for inviting me, and it's uh, always good to be back here and see uh, so many uh, old friends and former students. And uh, David, uh, in fact, David changed the title of my lecture because he said it's about sustainability and it's about emergence, so make sure you get both of those things. And so I tried to do that. Uh, I think uh, the, the issue of sustainability, and uh, I'm pretty sure David will agree with this, is uh, the central problem, certainly one of the central problems facing societies. Um, and uh, the question is, can we grow economically uh, without compromising the options that future generations have? That's essentially what the, the Brundtland Commission's definition of sustainability is, but that still leaves a lot of room for interpretation. What does sustainability mean? It obviously uh, it means a, a stable economic system, the stability of financial markets. Uh, it certainly means the stability of energy supplies, as well as other natural resources, and the maintenance of biological and cultural diversity. But for an ecologist, one of the key things that it means is what have come to be called ecosystem services. These are the things we get from natural systems, food, fiber, fuel, pharmaceuticals, the indirect benefits of climate mediation, the sequestration of toxic materials, the ethical and aesthetic benefits we get from systems. These are all the services and these are all threatened as we lose biological diversity. So the question that we need to address is, are the services that we derive from ecosystems sustainable? And I don't mean just things that have an economic benefit, I mean the indirect benefits, the wilderness, whatever it is that we value in these systems. When we think about uh, sustainability, often people talk about it in terms of uh, individual species, and that's the way a lot of environmental protection laws are written, but species come and go, and what we really mean by sustainability, I argue, has to do with the emergent features, I got in for the first time, the uh, characteristic regularities that we see, whether in forests or uh, lakes or marine systems, the characteristic things that we recognize that, uh, when they go, will tell us that the system has changed. There are, for example, and these are the things that sustain ecosystem services. There are, for example, regularities in things like the abundance distributions of species that aren't very sensitive to particular species, to, 
the particular microscopic detail, but these regularities are things that characterize the, the, the system. Um, and so my argument is that if we're thinking about sustainability, we have to focus on these macroscopic properties, recognizing on the one hand that they emerge from microscopic interactions, but also that they don't depend on all of the details. So understanding what those emergent properties are, how they relate to the microscopic features, but what's the detail that we can ignore. So that means we need to relate phenomena across scales going from cells to organisms to collectives of organisms to ecosystems and um, to ask questions like how robust are the properties of ecosystems? How does that robustness of the macroscopic properties uh, relate to ecological and evolutionary dynamics on finer scales, um, the things that most ecologists work on? How much of that detail is important? And ultimately, can we develop essentially a statistical mechanics of ecological communities? And what I'm going to emphasize more today, of coupled human ecological systems. So the macroscopic uh, features emerge from microscopic interactions. What are the organizing principles that govern this emergence and are there regularities across systems in terms of things like food web organization, patterns of abundance, stoichiometry, that is the relative utilization of different um, elements, and nutrient cycling. Can we model the emergence of pattern? Now, in many different disciplines, this, this question of trying to understand um, the emergence of pattern from local rules and interactions has been um, a topic of great interest. In, in physics, in developmental biology, Alan Turing posited um, a, a system to try to understand how an organism could develop uh, depending on local or rules of interaction when there clearly was no blueprint for where everything should go. Even the simplest models of competition, such as this that Rick DeRed and I modeled uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, in which you just give very simple rules of interaction and then let the system go, and structure begins to develop. And it's structure that you couldn't really predict from the individual interactions. Um, in more serious modeling, um, my student Doug Deutschman uh, and uh, Steve Pakala was involved in this, I understand he spoke here a few weeks ago, um, have been trying to understand how forest ecosystems develop. And more recently, uh, we have been working with Mick Follows, who leads a group at MIT that's been trying to understand the distribution of phytoplankton organisms on the planet. And what, what their model, which is called appropriately the Darwin model does, <coughs> is to build in realistic fluid dynamics, seed the system with a number, about 100 different species with different characteristics and allow the system to self-organize. And they've been very successful in predicting where um, what would be called ecotypes are, that is groups of organisms that have similar characteristics, not where individual species are, but the functional characteristics are regular and uh, we've been trying to put this in an evolutionary context. But in all of these examples, what we see is that the system plays out on multiple scales, that fluctuations are important, and um, most crucially, perhaps, the system is only predictable um, at a somewhat broader scale. The details are not what's important, but they're regular features that emerge. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the late great evolutionary biologist, wrote, and this is not an exact quote, so that's why I put it in single quote, if we ran the tape of evolution again, then the outcome would be very different from what we see now. Some of the broad features would be repeatable, but not all of the details. The evolutionary patterns that we see are emergent. They are contingent. They they're historically dependent. All of this is to say that ecosystems in the biosphere are what have come to be called complex adaptive systems. Now that's a, a not the ideal terminology because it implies uh, to a Gaia theorist that the system will take care of itself, it'll adapt. That's not what it means. It means that the system is made up of individual agents, individual units that interact with each other on local scales and based on those interactions change either in their behaviors or over evolutionary time. 
producing macroscopic consequences that then feed back to influence individual behaviors. So this is what we mean by complex adaptive systems. But not only ecosystems in the biosphere are complex adaptive systems, so also are the social and economic systems with which they are interlinked and which, where the management sits. And what are the main features of these sorts of systems? Well, first of all, there are multiple organizational scales as well as multiple temporal and spatial scales. The system self-organizes in pattern over time. There, are, there is the potential, and this is what's attracted a great deal of attention uh, recently for the system to have multiple stable states or multiple stable basins of attraction and hence path dependence as to where you end up and hysteresis meaning that uh, if you perturb the system from one place to another its pathway back is not necessarily along the same uh, route that it got there. The potential uh, as we've seen in economic markets for contagious spread and systemic risk and finally that uh, on mul because it plays out on multiple organizational, spatial, and temporal scales, the potential for destabilization of this system, whether we're talking about the circulation patterns of the ocean, or economic systems, or lake systems, through time scale, slow time scale evolution of parameters that are not evident in what we observe. In, 19, in, in 2008, um, th this was six months before the economic crisis, I wrote a paper together with Bob May and uh, George Sugihara, who had been a student of Bob. Uh, it was published in Nature called Ecology for Bankers, uh, in, in which we said, comparing uh, financial networks to food web networks, that there are common properties in these systems um, and the potential for collapse. Remember, this is six months before the collapse. We said these days, the increasingly complicated and globally interlinked financial markets are no less immune to system-wide threats. Who knows, for example, how the present concern over subprime loans will play out. Now, actually, I wish I had read this paper. I wrote this paper, but, uh, um, but it was theory. So we, I didn't do much about it, but we all know what happened. The, the good news is that uh, um, the, this, this has made all three of us rather popular with uh, uh, financial consulting firms, so that's worked out okay. Um, th th this, is, um, um, this sort of phenomenon has attracted a lot of attention uh, recently that a, a number of people in the audience here have been involved with. Uh, Martin Skeffer has led and he published a, a, a book on this topic a, a year or two ago, uh, which asks, are there signals, and this has been a a question that's um, a bit of interest to people dealing with complex adaptive systems for a long time. Are there any indicators, are there any signals that we can see, uh, such as the loss of uh, uh, diversity or what's called critical slowing down or other features that would be indicators that trouble was brewing ahead? And this is a very uh, nascent and still um, young discipline and uh, th there's a tendency to um, oversimplify, but indeed there are patterns, and I think this is a, a, um, an interesting field of inquiry. Getting back to sustainability and environmental problems more generally, for most of the large environmental problems, there's a lot of scientific consensus. So we all know, like the letter in the Wall Street Journal um, in the past week, that there will be naysayers, but on things like climate change, there's strong consensus on many core environmental issues, and yet, Despite that, oh, thanks, that's wonderful. Yeah. I won't ask where you got that, but <laughs> thank you. Despite the fact that there's consensus on what to do, um, adequate action to deal with th these issues has been lacking. And why is that? Well, I don't think it's because that the limitation is scientific in terms of the physics, the chemistry, or the biology. Rather, it's involved in the willingness of people to accept um, the facts and more broadly, not just people, but governments to make commitments that are costly to them but are in the common good. And there's this trade-off between what's good for the individual and what's good for the collective. Um, how, is, 
how can we foster cooperation in finding solutions that would benefit everybody? And uh, that's what I want to talk about for, for the rest of the lecture. So the central issues I'm going to argue are issues of behavior and culture. Um, these are issues of equity, intergenerational and intragenerational equity, of public goods and common pool resources. These are things, uh, in the first case, like, like the air that we breathe, and in the second case, like fisheries. Anyway, things that we all share, we all rely on, and which, all, which our actions have some impact uh, possibly on others, but where there's not enough incentive for us to do things that are in the common good. It's what the economists call externalities. How do we get cooperation in the commons? Uh, what's the role of social norms that encourage us to act in the common good and institutions? And finally, what's the role of uh, leadership uh, and the development of consensus? So this is sort of an outline for what I want to talk about. So let me begin with equity. We discount, we discount the future. Uh, this is a recent picture my wife took of me. Uh, um, we, we look at something that um, uh, we know is um, not good for us. We, um, we nonetheless do it because we will worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, this is a, a, a rich area of investigation. Um, and in, 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 it's responsible for a lot of the problems, but we also discount the interests of others. So how much should we leave, for example, to future generations? How do we discount the future? Um, this has been a topic of great interest recently among economists, debating what's the right discount rate to use. You could you make an argument, um, in, in, the, in the Stern report, it was something between one and two percent. Uh, others would discount the future at a higher rate, and there are those who would discount the future at, not at all, arguing we have to leave for future generations uh, the same things that, that, that we enjoy. Because that creates some problems if you're dealing with a non-renewable resource, unless you're willing to accept substitutability. And you could even make an argument for a negative discount rate if you take into account that population size is going to continue to increase and we better leave more for them so that they're same amounts per capita. So um, I've been involved with a group in Sweden that's been looking at these sorts of questions and uh, part of that was a, was a collaboration with Kenneth Arrow, the, um, the great and still active economist at Stanford, in which we asked the question, if one had, let's just think about one's own offspring, if one had a, a, a given amount of wealth to distribute, how much of it do you consume and how much do you leave to your children, taking into account how much you value your children, et cetera, what governs people's um, actions in terms of how much they leave to future generations when it's their children, and what's the role of uncertainty? And I'm not going to go into detail. This paper was published three years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy. But one of the outcomes of this, which is what we were not looking for, was once you know how much people will leave to their offspring, and this is done, for those who are interested in the mathematics, by a dynamic programming model um, that uh, sort of assumes that what you're going to do is what future generations are going to do as well. But once you know what people are going to leave to future generations, this determines the distribution of income, and the model predicts an increasing inequity in the distribution of wealth in the population. Now, this is no surprise to an, to an economist, because the inequity in the distribution of wealth has, in fact, been increasing. If you look here, for example, in 1962, the median income of the, the ratio of the wealthiest 1% to the median income was about 125 to 1. And uh, by 2004, it was up to 190 to 1. Uh, and if you've been watching the Republican debates, you know it's much greater uh, now. In fact, this is a, a more dramatic way of looking at the distribution, at the world distribution of wealth. There's a lot of uh, inequity. Um, inequity comes out of our model, it is to a large extent an emergent property. Uh, so too are its consequences like conflict, uh, etc. But intergenerational equity is only part of the problem. Uh, intragenerational equity, and which uh, means the, the fact that uh, with, within our own generation we have situations of this with very uh, obvious evidence of wealth 
side by side with poverty. And why, do we, why does that arise? It arises because we live in a global commons in which individual agents are acting largely in our own self-interest and they don't take into account the social cost of their actions. And when you think about this at the international level where the players are not individuals but governments, then, this is, uh, th then the effects are more dramatic and this is the way, for example, uh, the U.S. Uh, was viewed in, uh, with re some years ago with regard to its um, positions with, uh, in relationship to the Kyoto Accords. We function locally with emergent global consequences like the ozone hole. So the emerging challenge is to achieve cooperation at the global level. And the problem is free riders, uh, individuals who don't pay their own share. Uh, not, um, that, that's what makes it difficult to get a cooperative behavior. For public goods, um, William Forster Lloyd, nearly two centuries ago, introduced the notion of the commons, and Garrett Hardin popularized this. The tragedy of the commons, in which you have individuals sharing a grazing ground for their cattle, but none with enough interest in preserving that to take actions that will um, reduce their impact. But nonetheless, we know that cooperation does happen in nature. Uh, epitomized here, these two animals trying to uh, argue over which way to go, and finally they get together and uh, see that there's a solution. Um, in evolutionary biology, this has been a puzzle since Darwin. Charles Darwin uh, actually delayed the publication of the origin of species for about for more than 20 years because he was puzzled by the extreme forms of cooperation uh, that were, for example, in the haplodiploid insects, the bees, the ants, and the wasps, in which the males come from unfertilized eggs, and uh, they're, that's why they're called haplodiploid, so that the males are haploid. And the explanation due to Hamilton, which was accepted for many years, um, was that the haplodiploidy was very important here because it meant that sisters were more highly related um, than they would be in diploid populations like humans, sharing three quarters of their genes. But this has become very controversial recently, a paper by um, uh, Martin Novak and, and Ed Wilson, Karina Tarnita, um, in Nature about two years ago, questioned the importance of, of uh, kin selection. Whether this, whatever the, um, the, the truth of the arguments here, it's certainly the case that relatedness is not the whole story. We know that we can get cooperation through reciprocal altruism. Uh, it's indeed rather easy to understand how cooperation arises in small groups uh, where individuals recognize each other, can enter into contracts and agreements with each other. But how do we extend that to larger groups like whole societies? What's the role of, um, and, and how do we extend that, or can we extend that to the global level? The solution that Garrett Hardin gave to the tragedy of the commons was dependent on mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. And people like uh, Eleanor Ostrom have, have demonstrated the importance of this in small fishing societies. Uh, it relies a lot on social norms, on customs and, and behaviors that have become stabilized in the population. And there are lots of experiments among behavioral economists on exhibiting this behavior. For example, er Ernst Fair, who's one of the leading experimentalists on this topic, takes a room of this sort, gives everybody in the room a fixed amount of money which they can either spend on themselves, contribute to the public good, or use to punish other individuals. And what happens is, and he plays this game repeatedly, and everybody knows what everybody else has done. Initially, people tend to be selfish, but they tend to become public, punished, and therefore, over time, punishment increases, and in response to that, um, cooperation increases, and people start contributing more to the public good. Now, punishment is costly, so individuals, and I've, I've often played this as a game with my class, and you can watch how, how punishment arises. People are offended that the social norms have been violated and uh, will spend their resources to punish other individuals who have violated the norms. So punishment 
Um, humans will punish others who, even at cost to themselves. Punishment itself becomes a norm that emerges, that evolves from repeated interactions. And these sorts of norms of behavior become important to understand pro-social behavior. Some of the examples of how this works, um, where collective groups have managed resources are the lobster, um, the lobster gangs of Maine, which have regulated lobster fishing there for a long period of time. Uh, the water temples of Bali that Steve uh, Lansing has written about, and perhaps most impressively, the Tribunal de las Aguas of Valencia, which for a thousand years has functioned to resolve irrigation disputes. So we know that people can self-organize uh, to regulate behavior. With two students, Alessandro Tavoni and Maya Schluter, I've been looking at these sorts of things through mathematical models. I'll just give you an introduction to the model. So the idea here is that one has a common pool resource. Individuals can withdraw from that common pool resource. <clears throat> they can withdraw at a low level or they can withdraw at a high level. And um, those who withdraw at a low level who are following the norm band together to ostracize those who are violating the norm. And so those are the basic ingredients of the model. So this is the resource, and one doesn't have to worry about the details of this actually fairly simple equation, but it's an occasion governing the resource, E is effort, so that's how much people are taking out of the system. And we have two kinds of users of this resource. The cooperators who gain this benefit from what they take out, the defectors, D, who take out at a higher level, but then pay a cost, <coughs> which depends on an ostracism function. And that ostracism function is, a, is an increasing function of the number of cooperators. So if you have a very small number of cooperators in the system, punishment uh, is not very effective. But as they build up, it becomes more effective. And in fact, the dynamics of this system show the potential for a threshold. And that's the sort of threshold that we have to reach in society. If you're below this level, then you become an all-defector society and, uh, and nobody follows the norm. But if you can get the cooperators above a certain level, then the system goes to a new equilibrium. Um, and what this, this is the frequency of cooperators here. What this axis is, is the ratio of how much the selfish individuals take compared to the norm followers. So that's all I want to say about that, but the conclusions of this model are that norms of cooperation are emergent. I tried to get that word in a lot, Dave. Uh, and they depend upon consensus and collective action. Uh, we've also looked at things where there's variation in resource abundance. Uh, in other words, uncertainty, and uniformly uncertainty in these leads to more uh, cooperation in the system. So as we face a more uncertain future, hopefully that will lead to greater levels of cooperation. So in the next part of the lecture, I want to ask the question, how do these social norms become established? In particular, what's the role of leadership? How is consensus achieved in democratic societies? And what's the role of unopinionated individuals? And you may think about this only in terms of trying to get agreement between individuals who want to go here or, th or here. But it turns out that the unopinionated, the great middle group, are extremely important for the development of consensus. And to give some feeling for this, I want to turn to work from a very different sphere, or at least it looks initially like a very different sphere, inspired by the collective motions of animal groups, which has been a research interest in my lab for a long time. These are starlings. Well, they're almost all starlings. That's a, a hawk, a peregrine, I think, um, which is driving this action. These are starlings in Rome. And it's hard to look at this and not think um, that, uh, that these emergent patterns can be understand, understood like a problem in fluid dynamics, in which you have localized inter individual interactions uh, and collective patterns that emerge that, uh, uh, that actually have a function in terms of befuddling the predator. So we began to look uh, at uh, these sorts of problems, and we means uh, largely my postdoc at the time and now uh, colleague at Princeton, uh, Ian Cousin, uh, 
So if I forget and say I at any time, I really mean we. If I say we, I mean Ian did it. Uh, and this paper was published in, uh, in Nature in 2005, and where what we did was to look at a simple model of how an animal group, in this case fish populations, um, organize themselves. And although I'm going to be talking about animal movement here, I'd like you to think about it in terms of opinion dynamics in some higher order space where we have a trendsetter and a copier. And the idea is that every individual here has a certain velocity of motion. It's moving in a certain direction. Um, and I'm only going to give you an introduction to this. If anybody's really interested in this problem, we've been doing a lot of work on trying to analyze the mathematics associated with this. Each individual has a certain velocity vector saying where it's going, and then updates its velocity vector at uh, points in time in relationship, first of all, to what its intrinsic information is about the system, where it thinks it ought to go, and information about its neighbors, what their average position is, what their average velocity is. And um, I've, all I'm going to show you, I'm not going to uh, give you what the formula is, but in this particular uh, video, there are 100 individuals, only one of whom knows where it wants to go. That's the white dot, wants to go up here. The other 99 are followers. And the group never goes anywhere because the, the, the leader has, uh, keeps being pulled back into the group. The other 99 are, have, are entirely followers. If I have five leaders who want to go there, the group um, makes its way. And now here's 10, the group makes its way quite effectively to the front. So animal groups can be led by a very small number of individuals. This is the number of informed individuals, and this is how fast they move there. These are groups of different sizes. It doesn't make much difference. By the time you get up to five or 10 individuals, the group moves rather effectively and efficiently towards its goal. So we've explored this with different group sizes, et cetera. But the, um, the point is that not only animal groups, but, but human societies can also be led by a small number of individuals. It doesn't matter where th whether where they want to go is right. Um, I'll leave it to you to fill in the blanks there. So what happens now if not all of the leaders want to, how do you resolve preferences if, um, if say, five individuals want to go this way and five individuals want to go this way? Turns out that if the, if the difference is not too great, the group splits the difference. But at some point, it has to either make a decision or bifurcate. And so we've been trying to understand what controls this. Um, and under what conditions, the group, here are five who want to go north and five who want to go south, and the group eventually splits. Um, so we've been extending this to um, the problem of the development of consensus in human societies, or the problem of consensus in general, because um, this is based on a number of theoretical models, but also like the one I just showed you, but also on experiments with fish populations in which Ian has trained um, fish to move towards one target or another, uh, and then added uninformed individuals. Uh, and it turns out, and I will only show you, uh, this was just, just came out in science, I will only show you one but rather typical slide from this, which is that uh, as a function of the number of uninformed individuals, the probability that the majority viewpoint will win out um, goes up with the number of uninformed individuals. So what we're looking at here is a majority of individuals who want to go direction A, a minority that want to go direction B, but the minority is much more opinionated. And, and um, we've looked at this in terms of the experimental system, in terms of the model that I just showed you, in which there's a heavier weighting of individuals in the minority to go in their preferred direction and in two other theoretical models. And what happens if, is that if there are very few uninformed individuals, of an opinionated minority can win out. But as the number of uninformed individuals increases, the probability of reaching the majority target increases as well until you get above a certain threshold, uh, at which point the group essentially becomes entirely composed of uninformed individuals. And there's a 50-50 chance of where it'll go. So the conclusion from this so far is that um, the challenge is to understand how collective decisions can be made in the common good through mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. 
Ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are complex adaptive systems. That's where I started. In economics, this idea is uh, uh, reflected in Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand. Uh, the invisible hand is essentially an argument for free market um, management of, of the system. It says that the system left to its, to its own devices will organize itself into what an economist will call the, um, an efficient equilibrium. But the problem is that the invisible hand doesn't protect society. And uh, this is what we've seen in the last several years in terms of market collapses. Well, if these lessons are important for economic systems, they're magnified for ecological and environmental systems. Um, in the geosciences literature, there's a lot of discussion about ideas of Gaia. Gaia is the notion that the biosphere has evolved, has characteristics which allow the species that live in it to survive, but rather than view it as sort of an anthropic principle, it's often understood to mean that the system will continue to correct itself uh, in order to allow its components to survive. Well, we can't depend upon that. The, the CAS, the Complex Adaptive System Perspective, means that whether we're talking about economic systems or environmental systems, management's going to require a balance between a free market approach and a regulatory approach. And we're going to need new institutions. Uh, because cooperation is not going to be emergent at the global level. These new institutions are going to have to be adaptive to take into account the unpredictable properties of uh, these complex adaptive systems in order to maintain their robustness. Can cooperation be extended to the global level? Well, the challenge is going to be to integrate emergent mechanisms like evolved prosociality and endogenous punishment with top-down mechanisms like can be imposed by governments and institutions. Because many of the challenges um, are unpredictable, the importance of having an adaptive and flexible system um, becomes obvious. So we're going to have to combine all these things with collective action in order to achieve an adaptive, polycentric, governance and agreements at the international level. So what do I mean by an adaptive system? Well, in biology, a, a prototypical adaptive system, I think, is the flu virus. Now, most of you have had flu. You know flu has been around for a long time. But it, and it continues to survive despite the fact that we develop immunity to it. And the reason it survives is because individual strains disappear. Individual strains keep replacing each other. So the robustness of the system at the global level comes about because of a flexibility uh, at the more microscopic level. Uh, perhaps a better example to think about is the human immune system or the vertebrate immune system more generally because the vertebrate immune system has evolved in order to deal with the fact that we are going to be confronted on a repeated basis with threats, with pathogens, we can predict that, but we can't predict what those pathogens are going to be. So the immune system has developed a structure that involves early warning responses, a monitoring system, uh, quick responses that are generalized, followed by adaptive responses that are specific to the particular threats. It's not a bad model for thinking about how we design societies in order to deal with the fact we know there are going to be surprises and threats, but we don't know what they're going to be. The new institutions that, uh, that are need to be developed are going to have to involve, first of all, cooperation among many players, but it's almost impossible to imagine 200 nations getting together uh, to uh, develop solutions. We're going to need first cooperation among the major, major players, the US, China, other major contributors, for example, to, to climate change, and then hierarchical extension to other groups, what um, Lynn Ostrom has called the polycentric approach in which you build up from individual agreements. So let me conclude with uh, just a few comments. Our, the challenge facing us, I think, is largely a social and behavioral challenge about how to achieve cooperation at the global levels. 
Cooperation has evolved many times in societies, but often it's within groups and too often for the benefit of conflict with other groups. But we can't rely on that now. Um, in the global commons, as Pogo, which some of you will remember, has said, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. And so the real question is, um, can we understand how to achieve international cooperation by dealing with our common enemy, environmental degradation? And I think that's what we're going to need to do in order to achieve a uh, sustainable future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. sit down and let Simon deal with the audience. He doesn't need an intermediate. <laughs> Ellen. The slide you had about the elements of cooperation, you had that threshold you had to get past, yeah. which illustrates one of the major problems of getting past that threshold. That cooperation evolves once you have enough cooperators. Do you want to talk about how you get past that threshold? So, um, so there, there are actually a couple of questions I'd like to address that are related to that. So first of all, one of the questions that I didn't talk about but we've been working on a lot is, in general, how do you get cooperation in public goods situations? Um, and the problem that uh, I've been working on there, uh, is together with Avinash Dixit and Dan Rubenstein, is that the herders in, um, herders in Africa often engage in insurance agreements. So if I, it goes back to the problem of the commons, if I have cattle that I have to, that I want to graze and on my land and you have cattle you want to graze on your land, suppose that um, one year I have, a, I have a bad year and you have a good, and I say, can I send you my cattle to graze on your land? Uh, and you, why should you do that? Well, when you have a bad year and I have a good year, you're going to send them back. So that's an insurance agreement. It's a fairly typical sort of agreement. So we frame this in a, in, in a detailed mathematical model, looking at levels of uncertainty, et cetera, and asking, figuring out the discounted future value, et cetera, uh, is this a sustainable arrangement? Um, so it's, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. If it's not, um, then um, you, you've got to look at the problem in a the game theoretic framework and you can say, well, are there other sorts of arrangements that would be constrained, what an economist would call second best, that can sustain this. So the first thing is to look at the structure of the arrangements to see if, um, if the extreme forms of cooperation don't work, can you, uh, uh, can you devise a scheme, it's what would be called a mechanism design problem, that would be sustainable. And sometimes that might be a way to get you above a certain level of cooperation, um, after which you um, um, after which you could then change the structure of the system because you're now above threshold with the number of cooperators. Um, Scott Barrett, who is a colleague who works on international agreements, has described a number of schemes not so different than this in which you commit to a level of cooperation but only if a certain number of players enter the game. And so there are incentives to push the system above a certain level. You may need some inducements to get the system there. You may need to think about a, a, a pathway. That's why I think uh, beginning from this polycentric approach where you may be able to get cooperation in smaller groups and to build out from there uh, um, might hold some, some hope. So our model that I showed you was, was a mean field, well-mixed model. And I think building some structure over that introduces the, the question of the transients. How do you get from A to B if you, even if you know, once you know what the optimal solution is? Yeah. So uh, the other really important element uh, was the information and being informed. And information is kind of what we do. And in one model, the information in the leaders uh, seemed 
really powerful than the second, which might be more like the electorate, and there's a lot of sort of uninformed mass that made it really a 50-50 chance whether uh, whether the group would make the right decision. So, do you have any thoughts on, on what we can do better or ways of sort of getting the information? So, first of all, I didn't necessarily say it was the better decision. I want to emphasize that. Because when we published this paper in Science, we got a lot of flack back from political scientists who said, no, no, we know that it's best to have an informed electorate. So what this model shows is not that um, you're more likely to get um, the best decision, but you're more likely to get the decision the majority of opinionated individuals wants. Um, and because the argument that was given against us is, well, what about the civil rights when it was a minority, that was a vocal minority? This is bad. So this is not a value judgment. It just says that that the, the more uninformed individuals are in the mix, um, the, um, the more likely it is that the, ma the, the majority of opinion is going to override um, a, a strongly held minority. Uh, so, in fact, the, our article talks about the democratic consensus, but what it really means is, for good or for bad, it's harder for, for a minority uh, perspective, no matter how strongly held, uh, to get going. Again, I think that uh, if, you, if you have a, a view in this system of a minority point of view you'd like to get promulgated, uh, I think something that comes out of a lot of these uh, approaches is that a structured population in which you begin locally and try to build out from there is the only way that you can succeed in the same way that I was arguing for uh, in terms of international agreements. Um, uh, Jeff Sachs, the economist, came to talk to at Princeton four or five years ago. And uh, what he said, and he was talking about climate change, and what he said is um, what was apparent to many people at that time, that there had been a shift in public opinion, that there was a growing acceptance of cl that climate change was real, that humans were responsible for it, we had to do something about it. Well, then came the economic crisis, and things shifted uh, back um, very dramatically. So now climate change is, is, moves way down the list. So what I'm arguing for is to, and that in order to address these problems, we need to recognize the potential of, for opinion shifts uh, in social systems, that, um, that this can be for good or bad, that uh, we have to understand that it can go against this, but we also have to understand how to, uh, to learn how humans make decisions, what they value, how social norms are established, and how we can promulgate behaviors. This is a very nascent area. It's an area of network theory and the like. It's also an area that uh, has attracted a lot of attention from a different perspective in, uh, uh, in finance, where the, where the potential for, uh, for small perturbations to spread contagiously through the system uh, um, has... Um, has become evident. Jim. Uh, these models that, um, that, that pose the notion of a solution to a common problem by having cooperation emerge as an emergent property often have the stylized um, assumption that, that the individuals are of equal size and power. And, and, and of course, that's a story we can tell. But another way we could solve the global commons problem would be for one or two countries to bully everybody else into a solution that solves the problem. I mean, so, and the difference between those two systems, this one, you know, it's, it's differences in size and power determine the solution. And then the other people of equal power sort of come to a solution that's cooperative and as an emerging property. Well, I think the difference in size and power, that obviously can easily be built into um, into these models, and I, I don't. I, I think practically, having um, having um, a more powerful uh, individual is not so different than having a strongly opinionated. But already, by the way, I should tell you how this strongly opinionated shows up in the model. For one one model we look at is, for example, something called a convention model, in which um, uh, individuals have opinions, and in fact they have opinions and they have 
preferences. They can switch their opinions uh, in relation to their neighbors, and the more opinionated ones are less likely to, to, to switch their behaviors. Um, so I, I, I think I, it's certainly the case that in any of these models, one ought to be looking for differences in power, as well as for asymmetric uh, influences in the system. I mean, they often uh, assume A influences B the same as B influences A. In terms of bullying, uh, on, on the good side, that was close to what I was suggesting by the polycentric approach. Get the biggest players together uh, and let them come to agreement and let the system um, spread out from there. But, uh, but, uh, but we've learned a lot recently, I think, about how well bullying works. But maybe a system to watch here is, is uh, what's going on in Europe in terms of resolving the, the Euro crisis and the, uh, and the potential role of China, for example, as part of that system, the role of Germany in that. So uh, it's certainly the case that the systems are asymmetric. It's certainly the case that one had to begin first uh, it's just within the Eurozone by having Germany and France, et cetera, uh, agree on what to do and then to work out from there. Um, but, um, but I don't think bullying by itself necessarily is going to work if, um, if, the, if the Greek people are going to be uh, rioting on the streets. Yeah. It's wonderful the provocative statement that as the uncertainty increases, the, you see more cooperation. And I was just curious to know in what models you see that. In particular, are those the ones where they cooperate and solve the global commons, or are they the ones where they cooperate and follow the idiot off the cliff? So the, the, the two examples I'll give in that, and then I'll give a, 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 a counterexample. Um, I was talking specifically about the model of extraction of a resource, in which we had a, a dynamic equation for the resource, um, but we didn't have the supply rate of that resource. The supply rate of that resource was a constant. If you make that supply rate varying, that it increases uncertainty in the system, and um, the, the emergent properties that pushes the system it uh, pushes that threshold down so it's easier to get cooperation. In the, um, in the, and I'll give more details, in the paper with Ken Arrow, um, what we saw is that uh, increasing uncertainty in terms of the, so the, the uncertainty there was manifest in the fact, this by the way all came out from a question that I posed to Arrow uh, some years ago. Um, I said, you know, in evolutionary biology, we have um, the questions of how a plant should allocate its resources over its lifetime, et cetera. And in economics, you have the same theory about how an individual should spend its money over its lifetime. And then, although those assume infinite lifetimes, sometimes we know individuals die, but then they're replaced by their children. So there's you develop what's called dynasty theory, uh, where your children are extension of you. Uh, perhaps uh, with, a, with a discount rate. I said, but all that assumes, that view assumes that one individual is replaced by one individual. And even if that's true on the average, some individuals have two offspring, some three, some none. So how does that affect the decision? And he said, uh, after just a few seconds of thinking, well, it really has no effect on it. And then five years later, I bumped into him and, and he said, you know, I was thinking about that question you asked me five years ago. I gave you the wrong answer, he said. And then we started to, to work on it. So, so the, we can control the uncertainty in that model. And it selected, so there um, the question is, do you consume now or do you leave for your children? It's consuming now is sort of the hedonistic strategy. Leaving for your children is the equivalent of saving. So it's consumption versus savings. And the first model we looked at, the uncertainty uh, contributed to more savings. But then we saw that it depended on the particular curvature of the utility curve. So what I said before actually needs a footnote. Whether uncertainty leads to more cooperation or not, or more conservative strategies or not, depends on where, uh, where it comes. So for example, suppose I told you that um, um, you had a certain amount of money and you were in pretty good health, but there was a certain chance the world was going to end or the economic system was collapsed. Um, what, um, 
what you might do as a, a, a result of that, um, um, you might, if, if you thought the economic system was going to collapse, you might put your money into safer investments because you're going to be around for a while. You're going to need your money, so you become more conservative. On the other hand, if I told you, no, I, that's not where the uncertainty is. Actually, the economic system is fine, but you don't look so good. Um, then, then that kind of uncertainty might say, well, if I'm going to die tomorrow, I may as well spend, I've got nobody to leave it to, I may as well spend it now. So uncertainty, depending on where it fits into the equation, can work uh, either way. And it's, uh, that's just a teaser, which is to say, um, under what conditions will uncertainty in, uh, in the environment lead people? And I think you'll see both in attitudes towards the environment. Uh, when will it lead towards more cooperation, and how can we turn it towards more cooperation? So I didn't have time to develop that before. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to return to the issue of the, the lobster extraction yeah. fishery punishment in that system and whether that was uh, a sort of good metaphor for thinking about larger, longer scale issues such as global climate change. So how do we, my, my imagination is that, um, that sort of feedbacks and the time scale of feedbacks are very important in promoting um, emergent cooperation. So how do we implement institutions that, uh, that, that promote cooperation when we're dealing with very long, uh, long time scale, slow change? Well, I think that's, I think that's, that's a real, that's a real challenge. Um, how do we, how do we entice nations and people to engage into this arrangements? There are examples like the Montreal Protocols of, um, uh, where environmental agreements have uh, have survived, and they depend on a certain kind of trust. Um, namely, when, when, you, when I, you, I say you trust somebody that doesn't, or a nation that doesn't mean uh, that you like them and, and, and would uh, leave your children with them, but it means that you know how they're going to behave in certain situations, and the way you can enforce that is through, uh, um, is through cooperative arrangements that have enough punishments built in that um, encourage the participants not, not to violate the norms. So there are two questions here. I mean, one of them is what's become an active area of research in economics, which is mechanism design. How can we dev design a system which will work and which is stable over, over time? And that's going to depend. I mean, I gave you the example of the, of the herders, but it's going to depend on the particular situation, the nature of uncertainty. And the second is that um, how do you implement those schemes and get, get people to agree to uh, enter into them? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it depends on the particular scheme, but I think that, um, but this is a very active area of, uh, of research. How do you stabilize international agreements? And uh, how can we implement that? If I knew the answer to that, I'd pr probably be in Rio uh, uh, working on climate agreements. Yes, Ben. I was at a meeting once and Tom Shelby from a game theoretic standpoint, the best way out of it climate change is to pollute as quickly as possible because then as a country you move away from the case in which you're losing from climate change to the case in which you're a winner. Because there are, there are winners and losers and if you're a non-industrialized nation, you're going to be tethered to agriculture and things like that and you're going to collapse probably. So then he said, you know, case in point, you look at China right now and the way in which they are substantially changing carbon dioxide emissions is actually in their favor from a game theoretical standpoint. So I was just curious if you had any comments on that kind of situation. Well, I've been in meetings where Schelling, uh, on the other hand, you know, Schelling was the inspiration and the advisor for, for Dr. Strangelove, the movie, I don't know, uh, be, because it was his game theory act solutions to problems of nuclear disarmament, and, I've, and, and Schelling regards that as a terrific triumph, that since 1945, despite the risk, there really hasn't been uh, a, a confrontation. So, um, so it, I mean, it's, it's often, you, you know, you, 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 Colin Clark, who was one of the first to, to apply mathematical approaches to the optimal utilization of resources, um, initially built some models which showed that the best thing you could do in terms of whaling was to just fish it all down and take the money, because the growth rate was so slow, slow, and put the money in the bank. So I think ultimately we have to figure out how do you get beyond that. Often that's going to require, uh, if, if one country has an incentive to do what you said, 
then it may requ it's going to require some quid pro quo, some transfer of resources. Uh, and it doesn't have to be China. It can be Iran. It can be some sp uh, country as well. You create a, a system enough. It, does the system allow a second best solution where uh, there are enough transfers of, uh, of resources to make it in everybody's interest to do it? Was there a question in the back? Yeah. Um, in what conditions would you say that privatization versus cooperation will prevail to a certain degree? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me whether privatization against uh, uh, was a good idea. You know, uh, oh, you'll take that question. <laughs> um, so that's not an easy question because um, um, the, the the suggestion that that privatization gives people an interest and gives nations an interest. Uh, in, in their own resources can all, uh, uh, is a strong one, but it can also, under those circumstances, lead to the monopolization of, uh, uh, of the resource and, and selfish utilization. Um, so I, it's not a question that's easy to answer uh, in, in the abstract, but uh, that's a good question. The, the Bayer Institute had a whole project on, um, I don't call it privatization, what's the word? I'm, well, anyway, yeah. What do you think about instability as a driver for innovation? If you think about some, a civilization like Egypt that was remarkably stable over thousands of years, they were remarkably uninnovative, that any advances came from outside, and um, just over history, you know, 100,000 year history of humanity, for 90,000 years, we were in a very sustainable form, but also it seems not that innovative in terms of developing technology until agriculture kind of perturbed the system. And need has put us down this unsustainable path of growth. Yeah. So, so, so let, me, let me put that, at, that question in a, in a broader context. So, so if, um, if you think about the, from an evolutionary biology how organisms deal with variable environments, um, suppose I'm living in the, I'm an organism living in the, uh, in the marine intertidal and the rough intertidal. I can either be like a coral and be rather rigid and, and deal um, with the system that way, or I can be like a bull kelp and go with the flow. I can either be like, um, like influenza B, which doesn't change very much, or influenza A, which is highly variable. Uh, a priori, uh, one could argue that um, neither strategy is better than the other, but they may be better different. I'm, I can be like, uh, like Polaroid. Do you, you know what Polaroid was, I don't know. <laughs> uh, which had a very successful strategy, but, uh, but it, it didn't innovate very much. Uh, whereas other, uh, other companies innovated more. Well, one strategy might do better over a short period of time, uh, but be more vulnerable over a longer period of time. Um, the, the classic question in behavioral ecology is what are the trade-offs between exploration and exploitation? And um, it can go on with examples. If you're, if you're a company, do you in, invest in known technologies or do you take a chance on and explore somewhat? Um, so this trade-off is the, you know, it comes up over and over again, I think. What, how do you balance off export, the exploitation of, um, of a known problem against some investment in innovation and your example of turbulence uh, uh, unrest as, as a way to generate that is not so different than thinking about what the forces are that led to the, leads to the evolution of mutation or recombination uh, in biology as ways to continue to explore new solutions. That trade-off is always there. I think it's certainly the case that if you, if you have too static a society, then um, that works for a while, but really increases your vulnerability to a big collapse. Uh, obviously, if you, if you experiment too much, that's not so good either. Um, and I couldn't even answer the, the, the question of what's the best um, strategy to have, because it depends on a notion of discounting. If I say, well, what I'm interested in is the, the production, whatever the measure is, now and into the future, 
but where the future is discounted, now is more important. The answer to the question of how much uh, un unrest, how much uncertainty, how much is good <coughs> depends on what your objective function are. But your initial hypothesis is certainly correct. Uh, to, uh, a society without uh, innovation becomes stodgy and, and, and more likely uh, to collapse at some point. Yeah. But then what about the issue with the evolutionary lesson that the tropics are more stable and much more diverse? Perhaps because of that, depending on whose hypothesis you believe, and the temperate systems are more unstable, and that might be a driver of our biodegradic But more, more unstable in, in what sense? In the um, abiotic factors. Well, I mean, the, so, so the, 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 one can go into a system and see that there's a lot of turnover, the species replacement. And just like with the influenza virus, that on the long, in the long run might make it, might make it more uh, resistant. That, to, that, so that's why at the beginning I talked about looking at the macroscopic features of the system and the capability, capability of the system to continue changing and keep, continue innovating at the microscopic level you know, the, the theory of island biogeography emphasizes that the, uh, that the biota on islands um, are not fixed in terms of their composition, but they may be fixed in terms of the numbers. There's just a constant turnover, and that, kind of, that turnover is, is what's producing maybe a robustness to, uh, in case the system is, is getting hit by uh, some major environmental change. So who knows whether the tropics or, or the temperate regions are going to be more stable with regard to to a major perturbation. I think an argument could be made that the tropics are more fragile uh, in the sense that, it, that, that, that because of the, of the relative stability there, species have become more specialized with narrower niches and, uh, um, and, uh, and one could more likely see a major collapse there. I don't know, but... Um, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. talk about growth in terms of like percents per year and it always seems like more growth is better. But as a biologist, that's a relative growth rate and it seems like there's no such thing as a sustainable relative growth rate. Is there such a thing as a sustainable economic growth? So it depends on how you, um, I, I'm certainly not going to argue that more growth is, is better, um, but um, um, there are many factors that go, and as you know, I'm not an economist, there are many factors that go into this calculation, though, which is the ability, of, for example, of technology uh, to make saturation substitutions, and, w and what do you mean growth in what? If it's, uh, what's the right way to measure growth? It's not growth in GDP, that's not the answer to the question. But, so one of the products of this, uh, this Swedish group, the Bayer Institute, uh, was a paper by Arrow et al. was published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, uh, a rather conservative journal, and the editor said to Ken, I've agreed to publish this paper by you and your communist friends. <laughs> um, and so what we did there is to try to find ways to measure uh, the well-being of a, of a society. And this has to, um, depends to some extent on, obviously, on economic growth. But um, really, if it's growth in non-polluting industries, if, it, if it's growth in elements of the, uh, of, of the economy that aren't contributing to environmental problems, that's not necessarily uh, a, a bad thing. So we, we computed a discounted utility function into the future and including, um, including multiple sorts of benefits to humans and asked the question, are we consuming too much? And we did that on a country by country basis. And some countries were, the US was not. And other countries, and we did this with and without the assumption that uh, there'd be an increase in technology um, to allow us to deal with the environmental problems that were produced. So I, I can't approach the question of um, what's the optimal rate of economic growth, but it depends, but I think we, that's why there's a lot of emphasis in some economic uh, circles on what they call green growth and trying to look at what are the dimensions of the economy that uh, could grow without imposing an additional burden on society, on, on, on the environment.
had mentioned that. I mean, sort of great accounting. This notion of getting our numbers right so that we know what assets we're depleting, including natural assets, so we don't fool ourselves into thinking that we're actually growing when, in fact, we're depleting our assets. I can't remember. Were you on that paper? Yes, Alex. We'll find out. <laughs> um, I mean, so far, I, my, my, my impression from talking to Arrows and others is that this is a um, phenomenon that has not been well understood as to why inequity continues to increase. Uh, and I don't think, um, maybe the economists in the, in the audience do, I don't think we have any um, experience with uh, these levels of inequity and where they're likely to lead. Um, but if we if we take lessons, though, from um, Egypt and other places, increasing inequity, one can expect to lead to, a, uh, to shocks to the system. I think those shocks will be like, the, uh, uh, like the, those that occur in self-organized criticality, where there are no, not necessarily any indicators that the system's about to collapse, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but they, that they do eventually. So, I, I mean, maybe we're seeing evidence of it now in the, in the various protests on the right and the left uh, that are associated with uh, great inequity. But I certainly don't know when it's going to... Yeah. So, <coughs> it seems that a lot of the arguments for addressing complex adaptive systems are for institutions that are more like complex adaptive systems themselves and becoming polycentric and, um, and adaptive. less, less top-down. Uh, but since those complex adaptive systems have such complex behavior that isn't obvious from the first principle, so for designing governance from first principles of our values and we want our outcomes, if our institutions are going to be so complex, do we think they're actually going to behave uh, the way we want them to? Well, okay. Um, I mean, that's a good point. And I think that the um, one of the lessons of that is, is that the um, is that you don't over-design the system, you don't over-rigidify the system. If you try, and, for example, to introduce uh, controls to deal with the way bankers have gotten around um, regulations in the system, uh, as soon as you design them in, somebody's going to find a new way around them. It's a lot like the flu virus, and that's why I gave the example of the, of the vertebrate immune system, which is um, because, this is, uh, because this system is unpredictable, um, make sure the system is designed with enough flexibility uh, that allows it to be ad adaptive. But in fact, I think you're absolutely right. If you try and design uh, a, a system that, uh, uh, that, that specifies exactly what's permitted and what's not permitted, uh, then, um, then th that system is going to suffer from, uh, from the over-rigidity that will lead to its collapse. I don't, so what one can also uh, try to identify what are the features of systems that makes them um, robust. And th those, th the three that I like to identify there as most important um, are the maintenance of diversity in the system, um, the, the maintenance of some level of redundancy so that if you lose critical components, uh, then they're replaced by other components. An example that I focus on there is, if you remember, a few years ago, one of the big suppliers of flu vaccine in the U.S. Uh, developed tainted vaccines, so it couldn't be used. That left only one major supplier. It was a system that was prone to collapse. Luckily, it was not a bad year for the flu virus, and so we didn't have a disaster. But I would design that if system to have more redundancy. And the third thing is modularity or compartmentalization. Now, those things all trade off against each other. Now, why is modularity important? Well, it's important because, um, it, first of all, it prevents uh, disturbances from spreading in the system. So uh, if, if you had fire breaks in the banking system, uh, then you can contain, in the same way you can contain an epidemic, 
Uh, and secondly, it provides building blocks for the system to restructure itself. The modularity has evolved naturally in natural systems uh, because it, uh, it facilitates uh, um, maintaining, saving one's work as well as creating building blocks. So some combination of uh, some trade-offs between um, diversity, modularity, and redundancy, um, I think, uh, provides it the best you can do in terms of creating robust systems. But the diversity is one way that to, to make the systems adaptive. You have to maintain some adaptive capacity. I don't know. Do, do, you, you don't look like I've answered your question. <laughs> All three of those things, to some extent, reduce your ability to uh, uh, decide um, on the, the values you want to put into the system. Because if your values primarily come from your, you know, your individual actors, we have a sense of what our own values are. Mm -hmm. But when we design a system of that sort, uh, thinking that it will behave according to our individual values um, is... That's something that's uncertain if, when you give up uh, that level of control. When you give up what kind of control? Well, when, when you allow the system to become, become complex and adaptive in its governance. Uh, so, I mean, if, if, if you really thought you could begin by deciding um, how to aggregate, I mean, the first problem is how do you aggregate people's diverse values? Um, you know, this is a basic problem in, in ethics and philosophy. Um, do you take a utilitarian approach uh, in which you look at individuals' utility functions and average them, total them? Well, I mean, that's sort of flawed because uh, you know, we have, uh, our, our utility functions are very different than the utility functions of people in Bangladesh who would be satisfied with a lot less. Does that mean they should get a lot less? There are all sorts of complexities with any effort to, um, to aggregate utility functions. So I, I would argue that uh, uh, the best we can do in, in, in that regard is to, is to um, develop some, um, is to inform the decision making process and maintain uh, a democratic process. That, that, that's obviously got flaws too, but um, was it the Tocqueville who said it's a flawed system but it's the best uh, we have? Now I think I've done even worse in terms of answering your, your, your questions, but uh, so I better leave it. Thank you. Before we thank Simon, I want to make two comments and an announcement. The comments are these. First, I think you saw at work a glorious example of how one attempts to deal with an emergent problem. Namely, you decide on a candidate organizing principle, what might be at work, what is connected to work, what, are the, what is connected to work, what are the most important things, and then you have a go at a simple toy mathematical model that embodies the connections and the importance of that organizing principle, and you see whether it works. And I, I think we've seen again and again and in the example Simon gave us tonight of how to do that. So there's a lesson there learned for all of you who are working at some aspect of emerging problems in science. The second thing is, has to do with sustainability. Uh, what was very clear in what Simon said, and I'll just say it again, is there's no unique solution out there because there's no unique cause for why we are on, at the moment, an unsustainable path. There are many different causes. There have to be many different solutions. You have to pursue these pretty much in parallel as best you can and look for connections between them. And Simon, much of what Simon had to say relates to that. He talked about the most difficult probably barrier in finding the solutions with human behavior. Now, Alex and I, in organizing this course, thought about some of these things, and we recognize that the place where perhaps those barriers are fewest is at when you are dealing with uh, young people from, say, 11 to 17. 
where you still have a chance, where people are still listening. They haven't formed a worldview yet. You have an opportunity to shape the worldviews of the young. So next week is going to be our education week in this course. We're going to have two lectures, one on Tuesday night uh, by Sean Carlson, who has a quite different approach to bringing science education to middle school on up after school, not during school hours, after school. And I think his title is an emergent approach to science education or something close to that. And then on Thursday night, we'll have the director of what is arguably the leading environmental learning center in this country. It's located in Finlandia, Minnesota. It's called the Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center. Its director, Pete Smerwood, will tell us about the Wolf Ridge approach to environmental learning. 15,000 middle schoolers a year go through that center. And they come out very different from the way they went in. So you have a chance, those of you can come back next week, to listen to two major potential initiatives that may really try to change how we educate the young, meaning for the most part people younger than we are here, and ourselves about new initiatives in science education. Thank you very much, Simon.